Expository preaching matters because the idea of a preacher preaching is to preach the Bible. And it also means that we must somehow apply the text to everyday life. And so expository preaching matters because of the fact that it explains the inherent scriptures, the inerrant scriptures rather, uh, because people need to know what does the Bible say, what does it mean, and then how does it apply to me. Uh, the Bible is a book of, for all times, and so consequently, uh, since it's a book for all times, people need to know what does the Bible mean and how does it apply to me. And to me, expository preaching is just that uh, important and crucial so that people can know how it applies to their everyday life. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. I think you can do better than that. Amen. Amen. To Pastor Charles, our son, and to my daughter, Crystal, and to all of the staff and all of the lecturers to all of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. It is a blessing of God to have had this invitation to come and to share in this cutting it straight meeting. I was listening to uh, Romel last night saying that your favorite preacher ought to be your pastor. Well, my son flipped the script. So he turned it, so now it's my son is my favorite. <laughs> but son, let me say thank you and to all of the members of uh, Shiloh. Um, they greet me and they don't call me Reverend Wade or all that. It's a Daddy Wade. And to all of Shiloh on Daddy Wade. Pray for us as we seek to share with us uh, today. Um, would you stand with us? It's, it's not going to be long. Would you turn to the fourth chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew? If you go down to verse number 21. I'm sorry, go down to verse 23, all the way down. Reading from the Promise Study Bible, this is what it says. Jesus went all over Galilee teaching in the Jewish meeting places and preaching the good news about God's kingdom. I want to talk about, and Jesus went preaching. You may be seated. I have sad news for us today. And the sad news is that this is the day of anti-preaching and anti-preacher. This is a day when people relish singing and eschew or shun preaching. There seems to be today a popular prejudice against the term preach. There is an undercurrent that is seeking to disparage or discredit the term preach. There are even comedians who clown preachers by pretending to be preaching. 
When parents lecture their children, there are children who respond negatively by saying, don't preach to me. When critics wish to downgrade or write off a poem or speech, they say it preaches. The most tragic thing that can be said of an aspirant for a political office is that he preaches. There are people who attend our church and after the choir sings, they depart. There are still people who are in the pews and go to sleep while the preacher is preaching. There are musicians who play but exit at the time of preaching. There is a move on today by some TV preachers who seek to elevate teaching and totally exclude preaching. And it stands to reason that if people don't want preaching, they really don't want a preacher. But the paradox is of the matter is that though there are people who genuinely don't want the preacher, yet in fact they need the preacher. In fact, they need the preacher from the cradle to the grave. The unwanted preacher lifts our children to the Lord for dedication in their infancy. The unwanted preacher proclaimed the Jesus redemption story and we accept Christ as Savior and Lord of our lives. The unwanted preacher baptizes us after our conversion experience in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The unwanted preacher joins man and woman in holy matrimony. The unwanted preacher prays for us in the times of illness and sorrow. The unwanted preacher leads and feeds the flock of God. The unwanted preacher counsels us in the midst of our baffling and perplexing dilemmas. My friend E.K. Bailey used to say that the unwanted preacher has to fight some folk in order to help them. And eventually the unwanted preacher will wind up committing our bodies to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. To further prove that the preacher uh, is needed, uh, even though he may not be wanted, a church can be full of people. And if the church does not have the Lord's preacher, they say the church is vacant. Are you with me? One stage of my life, I was awestricken by this unusual paradox. On the one hand, the resentment for the preacher, but on the other hand, the need for the preacher. It was confusing to Pete that on one hand, they needed the help of the preacher, but on the other hand, resented the preacher. And then I've lived long enough to know that there are people who resent the pastor and preacher for so long and so much until they seek to even destroy the preacher. And I wondered and pondered as to why this is a fact. But divine revelation has opened some new vistas on the subject matter. And you know, let me put it this way. Uh, the president could be killed by an assassin's bullet. It's not his misfortune. It's his occupational hazard. A policeman could be killed in the line of duty. It is not his misfortune. It's his occupational hazard. The fact that a fireman could be burned to death or die of smoke inhalation, it's not his misfortune. It's his occupational hazard. And likewise, the disdain and even the hatred of the preacher is not his misfortune. It's his occupational hazard. Brothers and sisters, uh, let me just say it like this. It, it's something that people will hate the mailman because of the mail he delivers. And it's hard for us to understand this attitude, but the fact of the matter is this anti-preacher attitude is really not directed to the preacher per se, but it's directed at the kingdom and the king of the kingdom. In short, it's about Jesus. The Bible tells us 
uh, Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and shall persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. And then he says again, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then there was a P.S. to all of this, and that is Jesus says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. It's about the name that we call when we preach. And the name that we call when we preach is Jesus. And so it is about Jesus, brothers and sisters, that we call when we preach. Well, uh, I was listening to the television one day and a television preacher was being interviewed by Larry King on his show. And in that interview, Larry King asked the television preacher what was the key to his success. And the preacher responded by saying the key to his success is he does not deal with controversy. I said to myself, undoubtedly he doesn't call the name Jesus because Jesus is the greatest controversy of all history. <clears throat> and so brothers and sisters, when we call the name Jesus, when we preach, we shall be demagogically and demonically uh, attacked and striked by worldly iconoclastic people who really attack us because of the fact that we call the name Jesus. But let me say that anytime you make a strike at the kingdom representative, you actually make a strike at the kingdom and the king of the kingdom because the preacher stands in place of the ascended absent king. And so whenever you strike and become defiant with the kingdom's representative, understand you make a strike at the kingdom and its king. And therefore, the Lord's messenger is to be commanded uh, never to strike back but harmless as though because the attack is not aimed at the messenger, it's targeted at the kingdom and its king and the culprit who incites this anti-preaching -preach attitude is God's worst enemy who is Satan, which means that whoever strikes at the kingdom representative becomes involved in an unholy alliance with Satan. And whenever you strike at Jesus, I'm here today to tell you, you're going to lose. Well, let me give it to you like this. I was at a basketball game with my granddaughter, Sydney, and the home team won. And uh, all of a sudden, all this loud music started. I said, Sydney, uh, who is that? She said, oh, that's DJ Khaled. I said, well, what is he saying? Well, he's saying all I do is win. And when I thought about it, that's God's theme song. And that's why we can never give up on him. Even when it looks like he's not winning, he's winning anyhow. Are you with me? Now Jesus knew that even though preaching was unwanted and rejected, he knew that people needed preaching. And as a result, Jesus makes preaching an intricate and essential and indispensable act. And if we're going to preach, we must preach the word of God. God. Preaching is addressed to the unbeliever to convince him to receive Jesus Christ as his personal savior and to bring him out of darkness into the marvelous light, but it's also designed for the saint to feed him, to equip him, to edify him, to build him up, to train him, to strengthen him, to mature him, to straighten him, and to prepare him. Now understand something, and that is that uh, Every time Jesus gives a command, he also gives examples. And so look, look at the example preaching of Jesus. Jesus knew that people needed preaching, and Jesus' preaching becomes prima facie or indisputable evidence that preaching is a divine answer to humanistic need. 
we may define it as a divine uh, something that is going to meet men at the level of their need but Jesus goes even further than that it's a resigned response to humanistic need and man has a deep need for preaching this this is a day what is called the post-christian culture Philip Graham Riken said that this is the day of relativism and narcissism and this is the day when men are so solipsistic uh, which is the belief that self is the only thing and they believe that preaching is the supreme anachronism of our day meaning something out of sight but Jesus knows that in every man there is an infinite abyss there is a God-shaped void. There is a vacuum in the hearts of every man that only an infinite and an immutable object can occupy and fill. It can never be filled by anything created. It can only be filled by the infinite, uncreated, uncaused, unbegun, infinite, immutable God revealed in his son, Jesus Christ. Are you with me here? Now, when we look at the preaching of Jesus, it is what you call ordered spontaneity. And it was directed to meeting the needs of his hearers. Jesus really never had a planned sermon, but because he is both omniscient and omnisapient, meaning he's all-knowing and he is all-wise. And old people used to say that it is wisdom that teaches knowledge how to behave. And since he's the author of the scriptures, uh, he had divine systematic thinking that his sermons were never carelessly put together. And even though he was spontaneous, he was always organized. In fact, uh, let me say it like this. I, I've learned this expression, savoir-faire. And savoir-faire has to do with the adroitness of Jesus, meaning that Jesus is always resourceful to handle any situation. He always knew just what to say in every situation. And I think I ought to stop long enough to say to the preachers today that we who preach ought to be preaching from the word of God and give to the needs of men. You see, my friend E.K. used to say that uh, some of us give our attention to a lot of rouseology. But let me tell you something. It's not about how high people jump when they shout. It's about how straight they walk when they come down. Well, may maybe somebody ought to say amen now because this might not be too swallowable. And that is that we must be careful that we don't sacrifice substance for style. You see, style and substance are not the same. And this is a day that emphasizes style. Well, the proof is uh, that we are so as preachers into style until now it has affected and even infected some of our churches. And our churches are about style. Well, let me give it to you like this. The story is that there was a young preacher who was invited to preach at uh, a church with no pastor and when he finished preaching, uh, he was told, you preached a great sermon, excellent sermon, but you do not fit our criteria. When the young preacher uh, got home, he decided to write the church a letter. He said that uh, he thanked them for giving him the opportunity to preach, but he then said he was sorry that he did not fit their criteria. He said uh, what really got him was the fact that he was really not so much sorry about him not fitting their criteria. 
He said, but your criteria is of such that even Jesus didn't fit. He said, you want a pastor that was married. Jesus wasn't married. He said, you wanted a pastor with a PhD. Jesus had no PhD. And then you wanted a pastor over 35. Jesus died at 33. How tragic it is that we have such rigid criteria. We are enamored with style until we have criteria where even Jesus can't fit. Now, nobody likes gravy preaching any more than I like it. And when I tell you I love gravy preaching, but let me just say this, and that is a good cut of meat will make its own gravy. Preaching today is both urgent and critical. It's urgent and critical because human needs are involved. Well, we're living in a day, says uh, Philip Ryken. Let me quote him. He says, we are living in a post-Christian culture. As a result, sinners do not want their selfishness exposed. They don't want uh, the truth about their self-centeredness. Therefore, they want therapeutic preaching that makes them feel better rather than prophetic preaching that challenges them to live holy and right. They don't want theological instruction. They, want a, they don't want a dissecting of the biblical text. They don't want to hear the voice of God in scripture. In fact, brothers and sisters, when we come even to the church, too many of us, we want entertainment and not preaching. Well, in fact, what so many want is they want moraine and cotton candy. Well, what is moraine and cotton candy? Moraine and cotton candy is all fluff and no substance. But we must not cater to the wishes of those who have cheese whiz free agency religion and synthetic smorgasbord faith. We must preach the word of God. We must preach a word that on the one hand is a two-edged sword, and on the other, the bomb of Gilead. On the one hand, it's pie in the sky, but on the other hand, it's the now and the now. We must preach where people understand that there is a gospel that cuts and cures and tears down and builds up. It hurts and heals. It convicts and convinces. It condemns and saves. It curses and blesses. It strikes and straightens. It presents God as a God of revelation, but also a God of mystery and majesty. We've got to preach about the gospel of Jesus Christ. One writer says it like this, a gospel that says, even though I'm a bastard, God loves me anyway. And ain't but one source that has this dual priority, and it's the word of God. And if you look in the Bible, you will discover that uh, those uh, who were trying to seek to preach the word, they had the same subject matter. They preached about the kingdom. John the Baptist had people leaving town, coming to the Jordan Valley because he preached about the kingdom. Philip, a prototype of a deacon, preached about the kingdom. And Paul, even after his shipwreck, preached about the kingdom. And if we are going to make headway, we're going to have to preach about the kingdom. It's all right, brothers and sisters, to be homiletically and structurally perfect. It's all right to use beautiful illustrations. It's all right to be logically impeccable. It's all right to be semantically and linguistically and syntactically orderly and accurate. It's all right to know the Hebrew and Greek literal meanings of word, but above all, be sure that it's rooted in the kingdom. And I'm here today to tell you that if you preach the kingdom, you preach about a plan, a power, and a person. Are you with me? Now the plan of the kingdom is centered around the thought that God would rather give up his son rather than give up on man. 
Carboth has this to say. It is said that he went to Chicago and he was questioned about what was the greatest thought that ever passed through his mind. And he said, as he, after thinking a moment, he said, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I'm here today to tell you that the plan of the kingdom is to release all men from the fetters of sin. The plan of the kingdom is to bring to our awareness that we are an unusual paradox because we're too grand to waste but too miserable to save. We're too mean to live but we ain't fit to die. We're too dead to be alive but too alive to be buried. We're in a miserable shape. Augustine talks about the fact of total depravity. We are ruined. The young people would say we are tore up from the floor up and I don't care how we seek to cosmetize ourselves. When we look at it, we will discover that born in sin, shapen in iniquity, transgressors from the womb, we are in bad shape. Paul says we are unprofitable and that word unprofitable means something gone sour and we deserve to be thrown away. But the plan is that even though we deserve to be thrown away, the kingdom says that bad men can know that eternal amnesty is now available. And the kingdom's plan has is encouched in a message and that message is the gospel and the gospel is good news and then it is housed in the word called preach. Let me tell you what I did. I, I took a pencil one day, Pastor Charles, and I printed the word preach. And uh, I decided to see if I can get another word out of the word preach so I erased the P and I got reach and I said let me see if I can get another word and I erased the R and I got each and then I erased the E and phonetically I got the word ache and I discovered that that's really what preaching is it's designed to reach each ache And that's why people can't stay at home when they've got aches. Because when you come and you're confronted with the gospel, God's got something that's going to reach your ache. And the greatest ache of all is sin. Are y'all with me? Well, let me tell you, uh, I, uh, I watched uh, uh, when I was a kid uh, at 4 o'clock. A Superman came on and uh, KMTV and when we get home from school we'd always turn on channel 3 KMTV because we're gonna see uh, Superman and I can never uh, forget that was one episode and uh, uh, you know Superman maybe somebody don't know you know faster than speeding bullet you know more powerful than a locomotive able police tall building and uh, that, that that's the Superman I'm I'm talking about well uh, in that episode of Superman, uh, that was a man in an electric chair. And the warden was fixing to pull the lever. And as he was pulling the lever, Superman crushed through the walls and stuck his arms in the way. And all that should have gone into the man went into Superman. And I thought about that. When justice and righteousness and holiness was about to consign us to eternal damnation, Jesus came crashing down through the walls of history and stuck his arms in the way. And all that should have gone into us went into Jesus Christ. I just thought somebody would have been on your feet. I, I said, I just thought somebody would have been waving your hand. And you know, it, it kind of disturbs me that when we get to the church, all we want to shout about is my blessing is on the way, my miracles on the way, my healing. But if Jesus hadn't stuck his arm in the way. Yeah. 
Are y'all with me? Now, let, let me just cut across some of this. I don't want to hold you too long. Uh, when you preach the kingdom, you not only preach about a plan, you also preach power. Uh, we all know that that New Testament word, uh, dunamis, is the word for power. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know much about dynamite from which this word dunamis come, but I do know this, that it has leveling power and rearranging power. Are you with me? And so if we are going to preach, we've got to preach this gospel. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes it. I'm here today to tell you that this gospel has power, power to blast our egocentric hubris or arrogance, power to deliver us from the terror of despair, power to rescue us from the horrendous middle of the stream, power to deliver us from the rubbish which smothers the true elements of life, power to deliver us from the plague of futility, power to whisk away sin, power that triumphs over the grave, power that is victorious over death, power that is on the offense against the gates of hell, power that raises up bowed down heads, power that that gives ease to troubled mind, power that makes the wounded whole, power gives hope to a lost world, power that will frighten wolves, power that will shake empires, power that will crunk up karma culture and culture, power to calm stormy seas, power to solve unexplainable problems, problem to save the lost, power to change hearts, power to force us from the long-term friendship with sin, power. But now here it is. The key is we must preach about power with power. It's not enough to say we preach about power. Power, we must preach power with power. And power comes from prayer and the word of God. We don't want to be preachers and be in position like those nine disciples who could not heal that boy who fell in the water and in the fire. We don't want to be told what Thomas Aquinas told Pope Innocent II. The story is that Thomas Aquinas was visiting the papal palace of Pope Innocent II. And uh, when he visited, the papal palace was counting a large sum of money. And when Thomas Aquinas walked in, he said, uh, look, Thomas, the world, the church can no longer say to the world, silver and gold have I none. Thomas Aquinas responded by saying, but neither can the church say to the world, rise up and walk. If we're going to have power... We've got to spend some time in prayer. Well, you don't know the name, but I, I had a deacon by the name of Phineas Graham, and uh, you didn't know him. And uh, he died several years ago, and uh, we used to laugh at him because his uh, English was poor. He, I mean, he was really bad. He didn't know anything about subject-verb agreement. And, uh, but every uh, time he would get up, and we didn't realize that we were the ignorant ones until after he died. And, uh, but every Monday night he would stand and say, children, I want y'all to know what prayer can't do can't be dead. Now that might be bad English, but that's great theology. What prayer can't do can't be dead. Well, let me tell you, my mother who died last year, uh, one of her, what I call Mary-isms, is, was this. Singing moves men, but prayer moves God. And I thought since I was coming to the cutting straight that I would get something a little scholarly. So I, I got another definition for prayer that would kind of fit here in a scholarly setting. And one scholar says it like this, that prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscles of omnipotence. Yeah. 
now, 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 now we can talk, brothers and sisters, we, we can talk and laugh about our forefathers' prayers and, and how they seem to be cliche-ish and, and all that kind of thing, but, but I, I, I've discovered something that, that we, can, we can almost recite them uh, as I go along. We, we, almost everybody in here can, can go along and recite what I'm about to say. Lord, here we come once more and again. Knee bent and body bowed toward the mother's earth to give you some sincere and humble thanks. We come as an empty pitcher before a full fountain. And uh, Lord, we want to thank you that the bed I slept on was not my cooling board and the cover that I covered with was not my winding sheet and the four walls of my room were not the walls of my grave. And when I got up this morning, I didn't wake up in the judgment. My eyes beheld a brand new day, one I never seen before and I never see again. You've allowed my golden moments to roll on a little while longer and I'm clothed in my right mind and I got a reasonable portion of health and strength. Now you can talk and laugh about it, but one thing about it, they got through. But then, not only we got to spend some time in prayer, but uh, we've got to spend some time in the Word of God. Now, I, I teach a class at the E.K. Bailey Conference on devotion, and one of the things I have found in teaching that class on devotion is this, and that is that too many of us read the Bible for a sermon. We don't read it devotionally and meditatively but we read the Bible in order to get a sermon. And uh, let me say this to you. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I had a cold, uh, and uh, HB, you know that uh, store on, on uh, Overhill and Slauson, you know, uh, Simply Wholesome, you know, it's, it's a whole, whole food store, whole store. And uh, so one day I had this cold, and uh, I, uh, I went to Simply Wholesome uh, to see if I could get some tea. And uh, so my wife, uh, I, I'm a bone marrow recipient. I had leukemia uh, 18 years ago, and uh, I had bone marrow transplant. And after the transplant, my wife always said, uh, honey, always read, always read. And so I uh, <clears throat> got this uh, box of tea and uh, that it said for colds, and I looked on the side to read, and uh, that, that Dr. T started preaching. <laughs> I'm not making it up. That, 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 that start preaching. And, and guess what the subject was? The subject was the longer you soak it, the stronger it gets. And I discovered that's the way it is with the Word of God. The longer you soak it. I wish I had some witnesses in the house. The longer you soak it, the stronger it gets. And I don't know about you, but every day I try to soak in the word of God. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew the I try to soak in the word. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sin, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the I try to soak in the word of God. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not stumble. I try to soak in the word of God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pasture. He leadeth me. Did anybody here know what I'm talking about? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord the strength of my life. Of whom shall I'll be afraid when the wicked even my enemies and my foes came. Are y'all about to make me happy up in here? The longer you soak it.
if you don't get nothing else, walk out here knowing the longer I soak it, Well, let me get to this last thing and I'm done. You preach power, you preach a plan, but you also preach a person. When we preach the kingdom, we're preaching about more than abstractions and ideas and ideals and rituals. We, we're preaching about the personification of the kingdom, that person is Jesus. We preach about the kingdom and, and the king of the kingdom is Jesus. Acts 542 says that the apostles preached Jesus. The first sermon delivered after the coming of the Holy Spirit was done by Simon Peter. He preached about Jesus of Nazareth whom the Jews killed but God raised from the dead. Acts 8 and 5 says that Philip preached Christ. Acts 8.35 says that Peter Philip preached Jesus. Acts 17.18 said that in Athens, Paul preached Jesus and the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 1.23 says we preach Christ crucified. 2 Corinthians 4.5 said we preach not ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord and we who preach must preach about the person of the kingdom whose name is Jesus. Jesus said for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 1 reads in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the father through grace and truth. We must preach about the person of the kingdom. And we must preach about Jesus. I said we must preach about Jesus. I said we must preach about Jesus. I said we must preach about Jesus. I, about Jesus. I thought since I was in with a lot of preachers when I said that name. You know, that ain't just a usual name. It, it is a name above every name. And one of the tragedies in the church is we have become Jesus hardened to where its name has now become commonplace and you got to keep on saying Jesus, Jesus, Jesus in order for folk to get excited. But when you say Jesus, that ought to be enough. I said when you say Jesus. And we ought to preach Jesus so until when we get through people have an idea of what God looks like. Well, the story is that there was a man that walked into his home and uh, he saw his son and uh, his son was drawing a picture. Uh, and, and at one point the man thought that the boy was, by the way he was looking at him, uh, that the boy was drawing a picture of him. And the thing that his son was uh, drawing a picture of him uh, the father kind of candidly walked over and kind of with a little pride uh, asked the boy, said, uh, son, uh, who are you drawing a picture of? And just knowing that the boy going to say, I I'm drawing a picture of you, daddy. Uh, the little boy said, uh, well, I I'm drawing a picture of God. The father said, astonishingly, son, nobody has ever seen God. But the little boy responded by saying, but they will when I get through. <laughs> and I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters, that's what preaching it's about. It's about drawing Jesus so clear until when we get through preaching, men will know what God looks like. Well, since I said that, let me just kind of try to paint a little picture of Jesus so we'll know what God looks like Jesus. He's absolute in his affection. He's adorned in authority. He's beneficent in his benevolence. He's bounteous in his blessing. He's complete in his comfort. He's constant in his care. He's diligent in his devotion. He's faithful in his fidelity. He's famous in his fullness. He's girdled in grace. He's glorious in his goodness. He's irrevocable in his kingly priesthood. He's judicious in his justice. He's kind in his kingliness. He's limitless in his 
his lordship, he's lustrous in his love, he's mantle in majesty, he's marvelous in his merit, he's matchless in his mercy, he's magnificent in his miracles, he's omniscient in his knowledge, he's omniscient in his wisdom, he's omnipresent in his person, he's omnipotent in his power, he's precious in his peace, he's preeminent in his perfection, he's princely in his kingship, he's resplendent in his renown, he's righteous in his reign, he's stupendous in his strength, he's supernatural in his sovereignty, he's sure in ostentation, he's unfailing in his deliverance, he's unfaltering in his defense, he's vested in virtues, in Jesus, a fountain of eternal love, he's altogether lovely in desirability, he's chief is in chainless, he's merciful in disposition, he's fairest in friendliness, he's firmest in faithfulness, he's free from fluctuation, he's grand in goodness, he's highest in holiness, he's incomparable in his character, he's inexpressible in his power, he's inherent in his competency, he's intrinsic in his holiness, he's mighty in meekness, he's notable in his nobility, he's purest in preciousness, he's regal in his reign, and he's resplendent in righteousness, he's strongest in sweetness, he's superb in sublime splendor, he's truest in trustworthiness, he's unblemished in his integrity, he's inbounded in infinity, he's unbridled in his humility. I tell you, brothers and sisters, I, I tried to paint Jesus, but the best way I can paint him is so you know what God looks like is to tell you that one Friday he went to a hill called Calvary. And let me say it like the old preacher used to say it. His, my daddy used to say it like this. Jesus looked at his captors and said, if you think I'm going to fight, then nail my hands. And if you think I'm going to run, then nail my feet. But one thing you better not do, you better not raise me up because I made a promise and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. And on Calvary, they nailed his hands and they riveted his feet and put a crown of thorn on his brow. And but the Satan is at the ninth hour. He died on Calvary. He died until the sun became full. And the moon said, Two suns can't shine at the same time. And the moon became blood red and stars fell flame like fig falling out of a trick tree. He died on a hill caught. Is there anybody here? They took a spear and pierced him in his side. He dropped his head in the locks of his shoulder and died on Calvary. But that's not how the story ends. They put him in Joseph's new tomb and he stayed there all night Friday night and all day Saturday and all night Saturday night. But let me tell you the late Dr. Sandy Ray said based upon Peter's writing that Jesus between Friday and Sunday he slipped away in the hell and, and rode his chariot through hell and, and wrapped around his chariot wheel that hell and the grave and, and the host of hell said right on conquering king but thank God since I'm in a Baptist church let me give you the Baptist way early I said early early Sunday morning Savior, he's in the world today. I know he's living. Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of terror. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He's alive. Can you say he's alive? Yeah. He's alive. I've got one thing I want to ask you. Ain't he all right? 